Hi, everybody, John Cena here, and welcome back to Full Quest. We have a diplomatic special edition for you today. Uh, so I want you to say, John, uh, who are you and where are you dialing in from? Um, my name's John Everard. I'm a former diplomat and I'm dialing in from central London. Central London, that's not very exciting. We want to talk about small things further afield. The rules of FunQuest are simple. Each Funkster selects one of four icons. Behind each icon is a question which may or may not have anything to do with the icon. The Funkster then has one minute to tell a story, tell a joke or maybe even answer the question. Uh, John, it's just you and me. You've got two minutes per question. Parrot, some books, some boots, or some ladies running. Okay, I'll go for the parrot. Parrot. I know nothing about the diplomatic service. How do you communicate with your boss? You wander around to their office, you knock on their door, they say cheerfully, come in, you smile sweetly, and you say what you've got to say. It works pretty much the same as, uh, as with any other organisation, I guess. Is your boss there, or are you in London, or how does that all work? It depends. Uh, if you're an ambassador, then your boss is back in London, and you communicate uh, by, by email, uh, by, by written communications of various kinds. Uh, sometimes phone calls, but secure phone calls tend to be a bit difficult and, and a bit clunky. And, of course, when you're back in London, uh, you, you go and see him or her. See him. So you've been UK ambassador to uh, North Korea and Uruguay, is that right? That's right. You're in North Korea. Phone calls are a bit, you know, can be tapped. How how secure is life in North Korea? Physical security, very, very good. Uh, you're never going to be mugged in North Korea. It's one of the safest places on earth. But, of course, the North Koreans watch you all the time. What do you expect? So yeah. you need to assume that if they can eavesdrop on a conversation, they will. You have to be very careful who you meet, where you meet, and when you meet. So would you be in your office thinking, I've got to pick, am I talking in a code, or am I talking normal, or am I suspecting that somebody's listening to this? How does it impact on the, like we're talking now, how would it impact on that? If, if you're talking on a phone, it means that you've rigged up a secure line. Right. Uh, and you can talk normally, you don't need to talk in, in circumlocutions or anything like that, yeah. but you just want to make sure that that line really is secure and that you're talking somewhere where you can't be overheard. You can put some camels, a camera, a castle or a clock. I'll go for the castle, thank you. The castle. Uh, how did your previous jobs prepare you for this one? They, 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 they took me through a whole range of different experiences, uh, how to, 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 to write quickly under pressure and, and, and to, to write sharp, as they say, um, how to deal with lots of difficult people, how to operate in quite alien environments, uh, talking foreign languages most of the time. Um, and how to put up with a lot of physical stress. Diplomacy is tiring. I mean, you, you in bad times in diplomacy, you're working under constant sleep deprivation. You're probably jet lagged. One of the, the, the ways in which previous postings prepare you is it, they kind of toughen you up physically. You learn to operate when you're really very, very tired. And a lot of diplomacy depends on that. So it sounds like it's quite a stressful job. Yes, it is. Uh, Di diplomats, as a, as a, as a profession, um, have a very high suicide rate, very high yeah. rate of alcoholism. It's also good. Yeah, I hope you're all right. I mean, we'll talk about cycling in a, in, a, in a few moments. I mean, what do you think when you're at, you're at, you've got foreign diplomats, you've got foreign dignitaries? What are you thinking? I'm just going to do my job. Are you nervous? Are you think I'm representing the queen or the king? What, what goes to you? How do you kind of probe? Most people think I'm just going to work. Well, that's not like you. If you're worth anything as a diplomat, you know before you go into the meeting pretty much what's going to happen and you know exactly what you're going to say. So you've probably rehearsed this in your head a few times uh, and off you go. Uh, and it's certainly in North Korea, I mean, you can, you can have, have a pretty good guess at what they're going to say in reply. So yeah. you may take careful note and you, you tell London what it that they do say. If you are hosting of visiting uh, a British dignitary, because uh, quite a lot of diplomacy is facilitating high level meetings, mm -hmm. then again, uh, un unless you have a kind of career death wish, you have mapped out every last detail of that person's program. You pressed a button and you're running with it. And frankly, at those moments, the adrenaline is flowing so fast 
that you don't really get time or energy to think of anything much else. So you've got a, uh, let's say an MP going on a trade mission. You've got a thing of what they're going to do from minute one to minute, you know, they walk and they get on the plane to go home, everything. Pretty much, yes. Uh, I mean, you, you need to build in some free time, mm -hmm. uh, partly because nobody, you or the MP, can keep going all the time, mm -hmm. you know, 24 yeah. hours, but also because things go wrong in programmes. It's stressful when it happens, but it does happen, especially uh, in places like Latin America, uh, yeah. where you, you have to ad adapt to the fact that you know, in some Latin American cultures, people will simply turn up late or not turn up at all, or somebody different will turn up from the person you thought was going to turn up. Yeah. And you just have to run with the ball when it comes. Uh, you can pick question three, uh, some roast potatoes, some purple dolls, uh, a group of elephants or a fire. Okay, let's go for the heffalumps. The heffalumps. Uh, what jobs have you done previously and subsequently? I've done all kinds of jobs in international relations. Uh, and but my, my work with the foreign office was my first full-time job. Subsequently, uh, I was an academic. I was a fellow at Stanford University, and I went to work for the United Nations Security Council for nearly a couple of years, uh, running the sanctions regime uh, against North Korea. So again, international relations, though in a different context. Uh, so you're a cyclist. I mean, is there a cycling culture in North Korea? Do you talk about cycling? What, what do you talk about? A lot of North Koreans do cycle because, I mean, very few people in North North Korea have cars, of course. Public transport, especially outside Pyongyang, is very unreliable. In a lot of places, it simply doesn't exist. So how are you going to get around? You, you, you get yourself a bicycle. In North Korea, um, not so many years ago, relations between North Korea and Japan were reasonably good. And the North Koreans imported a lot of secondhand Japanese bicycles. And they still roam around North Korea uh, carrying people, carrying loads. A lot of collective farm workers load their bicycles up with farm produce and cycle off somewhere to try to get a better price for them. So a lot of cycling goes on in North Korea. Oh, yeah. So you were the ambassador when the nuclear, they did their first nuclear tests. How did you get notified about that? Did they ring you up or did you see it on the paper? No, that was a weird event. Just by pure fluke, uh, on the day of the first nuclear test, I was uh, with my German colleague because the German embassy in Pyongyang had decided to celebrate German National Day that day. It wasn't actually the National Day. They celebrated a couple of days late for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were all in the, the big kind of party room in the German embassy. And my, my German colleague was sitting at the high table with a North Korean vice minister next to him. And for some reason, I forgot now what it was, I had to go back to my embassy, which is actually in the same building as the German embassy, mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to go and check something. And I thought, as I'm here, I'll, I'll just check the BBC News. Yeah. And there it was, that the North Koreans, while we had been celebrating German National Day, they detonated a nuclear bomb. So I thought, what am I going to do here? I printed out the report and I went downstairs uh, with it, uh, back to the party, went up to the high table and simply put it in front of the, my German colleague, the German ambassador. And he sort of half looked at it. And then I, I stood back a bit. It's impolite to stand over people's conversations, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I could see him doing a double take. And he, he sort of grabbed this and turned around furious to the North Korean to his right, to the, to the vice minister. And I could see he was saying, oh, what do you guys think you're doing? And the vice minister, like a good North Korean, simply pretended that nothing was happening, stared into the middle distance and refused to answer. And that was how we found out about the nuclear test. What a cool story. So, so you presumably you know, hang around with the Germans and the French and the Dutch because they're, 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 you've got something in common with them. Well, yes, except there are no French and no Dutch in Pyongyang. Not everybody has an embassy there. Uh, right, but okay, the German okay, right, yes. yes. Uh, at the time, the United Kingdom was a member of the European Union. Okay. And part of the EU rulebook is that EU ambassadors have to meet once a week to compare notes, coordinate positions, that kind of thing. Right, yeah, so yeah, we did yeah. that. And also, also we, we saw a fair amount of each other socially. I mean, yeah. the foreign community in Pyongyang is not very big. Yeah. So you get to know your diplomatic college really quite well. Uh, John, question four, uh, first aid kit, uh, some purple flowers, a green tractor or a grey sofa? Let's go for the grey sofa. The grey sofa. I think we might touch on this uh, so far. What is the most frustrating part of the job? 
it depends a lot where you are. Each country has got its own frustrations. In North Korea, the biggest frustration was not being able to talk to all the North Koreans you wanted to talk to. I mean, you could ask for a meeting with senior North Korean officials and very often you simply wouldn't get a reply or you might just get a no. Getting through, getting hold of uh, senior North Koreans was actually quite difficult. Um, in Uruguay, the frustrations were quite different. Whereas North Korea, whereas the regime there, kind of holds you at arm's length, it likes you to be there because it likes the idea of having embassies, but it doesn't actually uh, want you to find out much about itself. Mm. In Uruguay, you've got the equal and opposite problem that everybody wants to talk to you. Everybody wants you to come to their party. And you found that you know, on, on a lot of evenings, you had four, five invitations to different events. Uh, you couldn't possibly go to all of them. And you end up kind of skipping from one to the other and trying to work out how to handle yourself in such a way that people were too disappointed that you didn't make it to their event. After all, you know, they'd be nice to you and you don't want to, to let them down. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but it, it did mean that evenings in Uruguay tended to start early and finish very, very late. It's quite a tiring place to work. Yeah, I would imagine. That was one of my questions, actually. You know, we see Uruguay on the TV. We know we see Uruguay in the World Cup and people like Luis Suarez. You know, how different is it to us, to a Western country, and how different is it to North Korea? Yeah, I mean, in many ways, Uruguay is a Western country. Mm. Uh, you know, Spanish-speaking, functioning mm. democracy, free press. Uh, it, it works in a way that isn't the same. You'd recognise the mechanics uh, and, you know, they're, 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 they're friendly and they like talking to Western European ambassadors because, I mean, Uruguay uh, is, is one of us. I mean, it's, it's a fellow democracy. It's, it's you know, they're, they're yeah, on the yeah. side of the angels. But uh, they, they are a long way away from everything. And they like just to ask you, what, to ask for your take on events in Europe, on events quite often in North America. Uh, right. And, you know, what do you make of what's going on? Which is good. I mean, you can have lots of interesting conversations of a good, strong Uruguayan coffee. When people ask you what you think, do you have to think, well, hang on, you know, what I think doesn't really matter, or do you give them an opinion? Oh, uh, it, it depends on what the subject is. I mean, yeah. sometimes, uh, you know, London have said, you know, tr do try to persuade the Uruguayans of this or that point of view. So you get into a kind of debate with them, um, mm. you know, and you, 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 you try to change their, their, their minds. Uh, but if they're just asking for your personal opinion on events that aren't necessarily too sensitive, you, know, you share with them what you know and you can talk quite freely and not directed. Uh, question five, you can pick a Robin, a Spitfire, a Flower Basket or a Duck. I'll go for the Flower Basket, please. The flower Basket. Uh, what made you want to quit? Easy. Um, the Foreign Office uh, was... <laughs> was going through what they, they charmingly called a decapitation exercise. Oh, no. They oh. discovered simply they had too many ambassadors and they were offering a, a really good package uh, to anybody who was prepared to sign up just to, to, to leave early. And I thought, you know, I, I've been ambassador three times. I could stay on and I could be ambassador in bigger, uh, bigger places and, you know, maybe be a, a foreign service director. You know, yeah. but do I really want to do this? For the rest of my life, the rest of my career. And I thought, no, you know, there's other things out there. So I decided just to, to, to take the money, as they used to say on a popular quiz co, to yeah. show and, uh, uh, and go off and do something different and did. So you've been working with the Youth Hostel Association. Tell us about that. Yes, I, I spent a year on the board of Youth Hostel Association uh, at a time when we were turning the organization around. I mean, the Youth Hostel Association is a, a venerable British charity. And, you know, it, because it's been around for so long, I think people tend to kind of take it for granted. But mm -hmm. what it does in terms of getting particularly inner city kids out in the countryside, I mean, you'd be astounded as to how many kids from inner cities have never actually seen a cow. Uh, is really, really important. It transforms lives and it does so really, really well. So I was very happy to, to support it, uh, to, to, to give what time I, I could to it. And I, I like to think to help it through uh, one of the, the choppier moments in its history. A re uh, reimagination, a rebirth, if you like, from, like you said, an older thing to a 21st century thing. That's right. Of course, uh, I, I left the board a while ago because I had to go to America uh, mm. to take up a trip at Stanford University. But now, of course, the Youth Association, like everybody else in hospitality, 
is facing real problems and real cash problems. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I just hope they, they, they make out. And it stayed true to its principles of low cost accommodation in interesting parts of the world, which is funky. That's right, it has. Uh, it, for uh, I mean, I cycle around the UK quite a lot, and whenever I can, I will always choose to stay in a YHA hostel, partly because they're such good value, but partly because you meet such interesting people there too. Where have you been on your bike then, John? What, what's your latest expedition? Well, my latest expedition was I rode Land's Enter John O'Groats in July. Oh, uh, 15 days, 1,760 odd kilometres. Uh, which uh, was brilliantly timed. I mean, without planning it this way, I managed to cycle just ahead of the heat wave. Uh, oh. So the weather was pleasantly warm, but I didn't actually get sort of fried to a cinder like yeah. so many people in London did. And it took 17 days. That's pretty cool. Uh, okay, an extra bonus question. Pick any icon you want, John. We don't care. Pick any icon. Right, the one bank centre. Question three, the Twin Dolls. What motivates you to keep showing up and doing things like being on shows like this and cycling and doing all kinds of other cool stuff? What motivates you to keep showing up? Well, showing up in, in, in shows, events, I, I, I'm fascinated by people. I like to be with people and I, I, I love to hear them talk about what they know and, and about their lives. Uh, so that keeps me going for that. For cycling, it's a bit different. I tend to cycle alone, um, largely because uh, if you cycle with somebody, it's hard to find somebody who cycles at exactly your speed. It's always a bit of a challenge. But I, I love the rhythm of cycling. I love cycling through nature. And I love the ability it gives me to visit all kinds of places under my own steam uh, to explore cities and the countryside and journey to get around. Excellent. Did you have a bike in North Korea or Uruguay? Yes, but the same bicycle. My bicycle really? is very well trained. How do you get stuff, British stuff like newspapers and beans and stuff, to a foreign country, to the diplomatic embassy? Does it come on a, uh, you know, Her Majesty's, you know, property, or how does it get there? Depends where you are. For someone at North Korea, where you know you won't get anything except for diplomatic means, there's a kind of um, an add-on to Her Majesty's diplomatic mails where where you're allowed to send. Uh, letters, parcels, uh, newspapers, that kind of thing. So you rely oh. on that. I mean, I, I, for example, I was uh, I was in Vienna for a year earlier in my career. In Vienna, you don't bother. You just go around to your local newsstand and you can buy yeah. British newspapers off the stand. Yeah. John, thank you so much for being on the show. You are a well. And how can we uh, find out more about you? And you've got a book, which I think is on order at our house. So how can we get yes. that? I, 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 when I left North Korea... Um, I, I did a deal with Stanford University that uh, if they would take me on as a fellow, I would write a book and uh, publish it through them. So the book, all about my experiences in North Korea and thoughts about the way that North Korea is, is called Only Beautiful, Please. Um, I think it's still available on Amazon. I, I hope people are reading it. John, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, and we'll see you, listeners and viewers, next time. Thanks a lot and take care.